Hi, everybody. We are on the money. I'm Maria Bartiromo, coming to you this week from Davos, Switzerland, where the World Economic Forum is taking place. The mood of Davos. Where will the global economy go next? And what will it mean to your portfolio as the U.S. stock market sets a new five-year high? I'll have my candid conversation with outspoken J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon. We'll talk real estate, banking, and his pay cut. We had one terrible uh, mistake in the year. And she's been called the Oprah of China. Meet the remarkable entrepreneur who runs a media empire and reaches more than 200 million people a month. On the Money begins right now. This is America's number one financial news program, On the Money. Now, Maria Bartiromo. Here's a look at what's making news as we head into a new week on the money. Washington has a new watchdog for Wall Street. President Obama has nominated Mary Jo White to head the Securities and Exchange Commission. White is a former prosecutor with a reputation for toughness. She'll replace Mary Shapiro and must still be confirmed by the Senate. Timothy Geithner spent his last day as Treasury Secretary on Friday. Mr. Geithner stepping down after a tumultuous four years for the financial system. President Obama's chief of staff, Jack Lew, has been nominated to replace Geithner. Well, every time you turn around, the market seems to be setting a new five-year high. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose this week through Thursday and up 10 of the last 11 days, while the S&P 500 followed suit. The markets continued up on Friday. The markets were happy about a battle that seems to be postponed now. The House extended the nation's borrowing limit until May 19th. The bill now heads to the Senate, where a vote is expected in just a few days. And mixed news on the earnings front to tell you about Apple, a big disappointment as its revenue missed and guidance fell short, mostly because of slower iPhone sales. Among other technology companies, IBM and Google beat expectations, as did Microsoft and Netflix. Well, there aren't a lot of people out there who were right about what would happen over the last five years. But Harvard University professor Ken Rogoff was. He was on the money with some very accurate predictions about the economy, about where the markets would go post-financial crisis. So what's next for America and the global economy? Ken Rogoff joining me once again with some answers. Ken, good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks so much for, for joining us. So how would you describe the mood in Davos and how are you seeing the global economy today five years post the crisis? It's a strange mood at Davos where people are not euphoric. In fact, you talk to heads of multinational corporations, business people around the world, they say, you know, things aren't even as good as I thought they'd be this quarter. But they're calmer. They're, there's a feeling that the world's not going to fall apart. You hear more about geopolitical risk, cybersecurity, and less about Europe's going to blow up tomorrow. So you're, you're not seeing over-enthusiasm, but it's certainly better than a year ago. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely calmer. So, you know, their theme here is resilient dynamism. And I'd say resilience, yes, and dynamism, not so much. You asked me what I thought of the global economy. I actually think, you know, growth will be moderate with not necessarily a lot of volatility around that, that it might be better, might be worse. See, I'm hearing a lot of positives about the U.S. economy if Washington can get its act together, but Europe is still a big issue. What do you, what do you think about Europe right now? Have we made progress and what's to come? Well, I mean, I think there's some big long-term things they need to do in Europe uh, over the next five to seven years. They clearly have bought time, what Mario Draghi did. But they've done some structural reforms. They've raised their pension ages. They've done labor market reforms. Nothing's happened in the United States, absolutely nothing. And I, I think there are reasons for optimism from the shale, uh, which, by the way, that's an area where people are excited talking about that. Uh, you know, and there's some optimism coming from the easy money, I suppose, still. But I, I, I think in the United States, uh, you know, if we get to the consensus, which seems to be 3% at the end of the year, I think that would be good. Let, let me ask you about the economy uh, relative to what's going on in Washington. We know this week that the House voted to extend the debt ceiling uh, for a few months. We still face the sequestration uh, and the co continuing resolution. How does this play out? Forever. Yeah, I mean, it's the like short that. answer. Forever. They don't agree. So we're seeing an overlay of this. Uh, you know, one side the Republicans, the other side the Democrats, and I must say post-election President Obama has become more aggressive. It's wider the chasm. And they don't agree about military spending. They don't agree about what taxation should be, entitlements, on and on and on, gun control. They don't agree. And on the other hand, uh, you know, we have uh, this sort of slow economy 
that makes it more difficult uh, to cut a deal. And I should add to that a constitutional crisis in a way because this whole debt ceiling has been a weapon that the House of Representatives has used to gain power. It's not just the Republicans versus the Democrats. It's the House versus the President. I don't know how it'll play out. Meanwhile, these markets are on fire. Another good week for the market. The S&P 500 uh, hitting a new five-year high along with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. What is driving stocks and do you think it's sustainable for the year? I mean, the part of it that I understand is that some of the risk has been pulled out of the market. So most recently that the U.S. has got three months before the next thing happening, but some of the risk, and maybe just that the election was determined and people aren't necessarily happy. Some are, some aren't, but it's solved. It takes some uncertainty away. Markets don't like uncertainty. So even though it wasn't very likely the European Union would fall apart, even though it wasn't very likely the U.S. would default on its debt, pulling that out of the equation. I think that lifted markets a lot. Meanwhile, new uh, appointments uh, in the Obama administration. Timothy Geithner, the last day, was on Friday as the Treasury Secretary. What kind of grade would you give his performance? And then I want to ask you about his successor. He certainly uh, served during a tumultuous time, Geithner. Well, I mean, if I have to give him one grade, I'm going to give him an A. Uh, are there things that, you know, I think he could have done better? Yes. Do I want to relive the financial crisis and try out my theory? No. I mean, I think, you know, he has to get credit. The economy moves back on its feet. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, there are many challenges ahead because we're still huge unemployment. We still don't have a clear path to fast growth. So it's, it's very much unfinished business. Jack Lew, what's your take? new Treasury Secretary coming in. Well, well, I don't know him, Maria, so, you know, it's hard for me to have any personal judgment. I have to say I was surprised by it. It, it wasn't something I was expecting. I, as I'm a complete outsider, I don't know him, but there's a little bit the feel that President Obama knows what he wants to do and is looking for someone to get it through Congress to fight these battles and not so much for to, you know, give him new direction. Ken, good to have you on the program. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Ken Rogoff joining us, Harvard University. Up next, we're on the money. How would you feel about taking an $11 million pay cut? I think it's appropriate. The board had a very tough decision to make. My conversation with J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon about his compensation, the housing market, and the U.S. economy. And is the world big enough for two Oprahs? I'll talk to the woman known as China's Oprah, who is a media mogul in her own right. As we take a break, take a look at how the stock market ended the week. Make no mistake about it, Jamie Dimon says what he means and means what he says. I spoke to the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase about the economy, about housing, and his cut in pay. News last week that you took a pay cut as a result of uh, the London Whale trading loss. Mm -hmm. Would you say now that this issue is officially behind you, or are there still ramifications around the, so the first, London whale? Well, first, deal? I didn't take it. I was given one. You were given uh, a pay cut. Which I think is appropriate. And the board had a very tough decision to make to balance the good of the company. We did have a record year and the bad. You know, we had one terrible uh, mistake in the year. And so, hey, look, we've, we've fixed the problem from a financial risk for the most part. Uh, we've, we've disclosed both a company report and a completely independent board report with independent outside advisors and counsel, et cetera. You know, the regulators, of course, will have their reviews to do, so there'll be more ongoing things from that. But, you know, we've mostly got the problem behind. We've cleaned up CIO, and we've, put, you know, we've changed procedures to make sure we manage the company properly going forward. So what kind of changes might we expect going forward in terms of changing the bank, restructuring how the, the governance is, is, uh, is done? No, look, look, I'm very proud of J.P. Morgan. You know, we last year, I think, had $1.8 trillion of capital or credit for consumers or businesses. We had a problem. You know, we, we've fully acknowledged that we've undressed ourselves in the public. The rest of the bank is pretty well controlled and pretty well managed. And, you know, it's the same bank that went through 07, 08, 09, 2010, 2011, and, and for the most part did fine. And, but whenever a company makes a mistake, you should analyze it and try to be better for it and make sure you apply best practices across the company. So most of the mistake was in CIO. There are a couple of things we learned that we were applying across the company. Let me ask you about the U.S. Um, it, we, we saw that mortgage originations were up huge uh, for you in the quarter. You've been talking a lot in the last couple of years now about housing really showing some 
true improvement right. and, and having bottomed. Right. Where are we in that? What are you expecting in the next couple yeah. of years in terms of housing? Yeah. So housing is totally bottomed and it's getting better. You know, And you saw today the report that homes for sales come so far down that they're in short supply in certain markets. And they're all leading indicators. We had three million Americans a year. Cheap, it's cheaper to buy than to rent. All time affordability because prices are low and mortgage rates are like three and a half percent. And uh, But it's not going to be an absence of a strong economy. You know, I really think at this point it'll be the economy will drive housing. What are you expecting elsewhere in terms of the regulatory environment? I mean, we're all wondering how Dodd-Frank plays out. We're all wondering how the Volcker Rule plays out. What if the Volcker Rule materializes and, in fact, it forces a separation from proprietary trading and plain vanilla deposit taking? How are you going to well, respond? That's, that's not the Volcker Rule. That's, the Volcker Rule is about... Proprietary trading versus... So, so, put, 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 no one's doing proprietary trading. So it's, it's really the parameters by which you do market making. I always remind the public, we have the widest, deepest, most transparent, best capital markets in the whole world. So no, I'm not opposed to the intent of the Volcker Rule. The question is, let's make sure when we finish, we have the widest, deepest, best, most transparent capital markets in the world. And so market making, we serve 20,000 customers. We give them great prices, capital, advice, execution. They come to us because we give them a good price, just like Walmart gives you a good price. And we serve, and we do a lot of it, you know, and that's, that's a good thing that keeps the cost of issuance and the cost of buying cheap. Who does it keep it cheap for? Retirees, pensions, municipalities, corporations. In terms of the Federal Reserve and this low interest rate environment, how do you offset this difficulty in terms of yeah. uh, making money in such, a, in, in such a low rate environment? One of the funny things here, I keep on hearing that, that the banks have benefited by a low rate environment, they're subsidized because of the low rate environment, which isn't true. You're more right, it hurts us more than, help, uh, than helps us. So we've told the world it squeezes our net income by about $500 million a year. There will be a reverse side to that. Rates will go up one day and we'll get that back. So we, we're investing in the business as if it were a normal environment. We know right now our margins are lower. It's just like if you were running a pizza shop and the cost of mozzarella was higher, you wouldn't stop selling pizzas because your margin was lower. You know that one day the cost of mozzarella may come down again. So you know, we, we try to be long-term there and think it through. What policies will create jobs? That's what we're all trying to figure out. How do you create Look, jobs? Look, I, I, I think I've been fairly consistent that, that if we had done a Simpson, the grand bargain, it doesn't have to be exactly the one that anyone wants. Just a, that showed that Americans can make decisions. It set a more effective tax system. It reduced tax uncertainty going forward. And I think we could have had have a booming environment. Now, I may be wrong. That's my own personal belief. If we have a grand bargain, America take off. I think it's very important for America to get strong because the rest of the world needs us to. You know, because Europe still has its issues and it will for a couple of years. So I, I think it's important that America kind of take the lead here. And I'm hoping our Congress and our president, that's what they do. What does your gut tell you about all this money moving into stocks recently? We've had a fantastic year, early uh, 2013. Do you think this is sustainable? Yeah, you know, the economy grows is sustainable. And I still think you can buy American companies at pretty good prices. These are some of the world class companies, you know, and that's not just American companies, they're European and Japanese and, uh, uh, and Chinese companies, but you're still buying them at fairly good prices. And your alternatives aren't that good. So, yeah. I'm comfortable owning stocks right now. My thanks to Jamie Dimon. Well, the state of business, the state of investors, and the state of Europe, all part of the conversation here at Davos this week. From city CEO to a billionaire philanthropist, here's what they had to say. Our strategy, Marie, is, is really focused around a few of the big secular things that are going on in the world. Globalization, urbanization, digitization. And so if you think of globalization, you look at what's going on in the economy, most of the growth is coming from the uh, developing countries. The markets, as you point out, they're, they're recovering. Uh, investors had something like a 15% increase in their 401k plans last year. Housing prices have recovered. The net wealth effect is increasing the confidence of investors to participate. And there's obviously a rotation from bonds to equities. There's a general sense of, uh, let's say, eu almost euphoria that the crisis is over. I think that is somewhat premature uh, because the fundamental uh, internal inconsistencies in the system have not been addressed. Up next, we are on the money, and so is Yang Lan, the woman many call China's Oprah her reach, her media empire, and how her generation is reinventing China. And you can find us on Facebook slash Maria Bartiromo.
My next guest is referred to as the Chinese Oprah. Yang Lan is the host of several national television shows in China, such as Yang Lan One on One and Her Village. She also co-founded Sun Media Investment Holdings with her husband, Bruno Wu. Lan, it's nice to have you on the program. Maria, thank you for having me. Welcome. So tell me about your Davos experience. China, certainly mm. a topic of conversation. Everyone's mm. trying to figure out what's going on in the country. How has your week been? Well, uh, it has been uh, terrific uh, meeting so many people and updated by uh, information on so many different fronts. And of course, China is a hot topic. Actually, this is, uh, I think, the most important and critical period of time in Chinese history. We do look forward to our uh, new generation of uh, state leaders can move this country forward to be more open, democratic, and giving people more choices and opportunities. Mm -hmm. But now you, you do read mixed messages all the time, so sometimes I'm confused myself. Do you think that we will see a more open China? I, mean, I think so. Someone was telling me about Weibo, which is yeah. the equivalent of Twitter. That's a uh, social in, media. In, yes, in, in China. And is that making a difference? Definitely. I think technology is providing uh, the largest public arena for ordinary Chinese people to give them a voice. So I think, uh, you know, when people are talking about where China will go, I think there's only one sensible uh, orientation, which is to be more open and, and uh, uh, democratic. And you have how many followers on Weibo? I have 35 million. Amazing. <laughs> that is a, so, well, so I try to try to make some good changes uh, through that. public comments mm. about uh, social media allowing people to let off steam. And That's are right. they doing that? Definitely, definitely. Uh, and also they are contributing to the uh, uh, social and economic progress of the, of the country by disclosing uh, corruption, by uh, 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 debating on public policies from traffic to housing to education to medical services. And also, it's, it's great fun and ent entertainment. You see people very creative, and especially young people. I always enjoy reading their comments, things like that. That is fantastic. Yeah. Well, you're a self-made entrepreneur, so impressive. Several television shows, a growing media empire, mm. uh, the, the company that you manage, hence the Oprah comparison. Mm. Which I, which <laughs> Thank I you. It's, it's a compliment. I have a lot of admir admiration for her because what she has done you know, to empower women. I Absolutely. have a lot of uh, admiration. So tell us about your shows in China. Who is your audience? Well, I have um, uh, two major shows. Yang Lan One on One is more about in-depth interview show uh, with uh, movers and shapers around the world. It's been on air for 13 years. I've interviewed more than 600 uh, 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 leaders around the world, including many uh, U.S. presidents and uh, Secretary of States. Uh, and my another show, Her Village, is more like opera show plus The View, because I have two other younger women who are providing different perspectives onto certain issues that women care for. And we have celebrities as well as grassroots women telling their extraordinary stories. Are there professional opportunities and are they growing for women? In China? Oh, definitely. Actually, uh, you know, in China, about 48% of the workforce are women. About um, more than half of uh, college attenders and the graduate school students are women. Um, about 30% of business school uh, students are women, and 30% of uh, 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 entrepreneurs are women. So uh, Chinese women are becoming uh, a very a critical voice uh, in the society. And, and what's your take on, on China today in terms of whether it's slowing down uh, this transition from an export-led uh, economy to a consumer economy? Is that on track? How, how would you characterize things? Well, I, I think, well, people have different ideas and expectations about this pace of transition. But there's no issue that everyone believes that we have to go through this structural uh, change uh, of our e economic productivity uh, uh, to be more environmentally friendly, to be more sustainable, uh, uh, to be more value added is definitely the way to go. Uh, and I think to make people spend more and save less uh, is to provide them with a more complete social and um, uh, in medical welfare, and so that people would uh, 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 feel safe to spend the money there. Sure, it's mm. still a, a big saver uh, community. Yang Lan, right. good to have you on the program. Thank you, Maria. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. having me. Good to see you. Thank you. Up next, a look at the news this week that will have an impact on the money. And then, the art of coming together to solve the world's problems. The scenes of Davos offer tranquility on the mountain. For more on our show and our guests, check out the website.
otm.cnbc.com. And I hope you'll follow me on Twitter and on Google+. Look for at Maria Bartiromo. And now a look at the stories coming up in the week ahead that may impact your money and impact the markets. A busy week ahead for economic and earnings news to tell you about. We'll get earnings news from Dow Components Boeing, ExxonMobil, Chevron, in addition to Amazon.com and Facebook. On Monday, pending home sales will be released. Then on Tuesday, the Case-Shiller Home Price Index is out. On Wednesday, the Federal Reserve will wrap up a two-day meeting with an announcement on policy and interest rates. And we'll also get the first reading on gross domestic product for the last quarter of the year. That's typically a market mover, as is the report on Friday, the all-important jobs report, sure to move the markets. We'll be watching that. Well, it has been quite a week here in Davos where solving the world's problems is the state of the art. Abstract artist Daniel Ibarra created a series of collages for the World Economic Forum's Congress Center, Main Hall. It's called the Tranquil Labyrinth. They represent the process of growth, a colorful theme for an event that stresses cooperation and innovation. That's the show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you back in New York next week. The business of Broadway, seeing green in the bright lights of Broadway. Each week, keep it right here where we are on the money. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'll see you again next weekend.